and welcome to Role Playing History, the podcast where we explore the history of role playing games. I'm Wayne Davis, and I'll be your guide for today's tour. Episode 25 Paranoia. Last week, we explored the history of the game company West End Games, as well as a career look at game designer Greg Kostikian. Since we've looked at the game company and one of the creators, this week we're going to take a closer look at the game that put both of them on the role-playing game map, Paranoia. Over the years, Paranoia has sold tons of copies, won numerous awards, and has developed a rapidly loyal following. It's also become one of those games that has no middle ground. You either love it so much you'll fight for it, or you have no idea what the hell it's all about and don't really care. Hopefully by the end of this episode, you'll be interested in checking it out. Oh, and to the folks at Mongoose Publishing, we can talk about some sort of royalty payment for sales a little later on. Just kidding. So, as we discussed in last week's episode, Paranoia came from an idea originally developed by Dan Gelber. His friends, Greg Kostikian and Eric Goldberg, had recently gone to work at West End Games, and they took his idea and presented it to Scott Palter, who owned the company. And after he gave that go-ahead, they published the game and released it in 1984. The game industry hadn't really seen anything like Paranoia by that point, and it sold exceptionally well. It was also widely well-reviewed and won the 1985 Origins Award for Best Role-Playing Rules of 1984. This initial version of the game is the one most gamers think of when they think of Paranoia. A serious dystopian tone, but cut with a ton of dark humor. Along the way, supplements were released for the games that tended to bring a more light-hearted tone to the game, with some slapstick, satire, and intra-team backstabbing added into the mix. Things went so well, West End Games decided to update Paranoia, and 2nd Edition was released in 1987. Ken Rolston and Paul Murphy joined Gelber, Kostikian, and Goldberg as the designers for this version, which embraced a trend that had emerged with Paranoia over the past three years. The dark dystopia was pushed farther into the background, with the humor, slapstick, and backstabbing emphasized even more. In 2nd edition, Paranoia became more about the possibilities of living in a paranoid dystopia rather than surviving it. 2nd edition also seemed to divide itself into four eras with various supplements, and we'll detail those a little bit later on when we discuss the actual gameplay. Again, 2nd edition was pretty well reviewed, and it sold fairly well as well. In 1995, West End Games again decided to update Paranoia. With 11 years of Paranoia under the company's belt, they decided to not only roll out a new edition, but they put their tongue firmly in their cheek by calling it 5th edition. It should also be noted that for some inside the company, the skipping of two editions in numbering was also due to two somewhat major revisions of the game during second edition, the Crash Course Manual and the Paranoia Sourcebook. However, not only did nobody get the joke, nobody got the game. Reviews of 5th edition were brutal, with reviewers taking on everything from the rules themselves to the overall production of the books. Needless to say, the sales tanked as well, and 5th edition was almost immediately forgotten about. In fact, this edition of Paranoia is known as an unproduct by the current production team at Mongoose Publishing. Yes, it's a take of unperson from various dystopic universes, and yes, it makes sense. If I had a bomb like that in my past, I'd want to disavow it as well. If I could. But I can't. Anyway, when I was researching West End Games for last week's show, I was curious about how things could have gotten so bad so quickly for their top-tier product. In this week's research, I found a piece from Alan Varney, who detailed the issues in Flashbacks, which is a compilation of Paranoia Adventures from the West End Games era. Varney pointed out that there were a number of management decisions that, altogether, saw Paranoia take a 90% nosedive in sales before the bankruptcy of West End Games. Here's what he had to say. Art director Larry Catalano left West End in 1986. 
Catalano's successor fired illustrator Jim Holloway and brought in a succession of increasingly poor cartoonists. Writer-editor Ken Rolston left shortly thereafter for unrelated reasons. In Ken's wake, developers Doug Kaufman and Paul Murphy in turn briefly supervised the paranoia line. After they too departed, editorial control fell to, how do I put this tactfully, people with different views of the paranoia line. To hear this type of behind-the-scenes chaos lead to a poor sales of a long-running product and the eventual fall of a company is nothing new. However, that the chaos is so easily detailable is, in my experience, a pretty unusual thing. So, with the 5th edition bombing, West End Games decided that maybe they should forget about that version and try again. At Gen Con in 1997, West End Games exhibited pages from what they said would be the third edition of Paranoia. It was intended to be a new version, and it sounded like even West End Games was ignoring the fifth edition. At that time, however, West End Games was already experiencing financial difficulties. By 1999, Scott Palter had expressed hopes in multiple interviews that the third edition of Paranoia would be getting published sometime that summer. However, this version of Paranoia would never see the light of day. As we discussed last week, the bankruptcy issues with West End Games caused Greg Kostikian and Eric Goldberg to take Palter to court in order to reacquire the rights to Paranoia. In 2000, they were successful with this, and the original version of West End Games was no longer. One more note on this unpublished third edition. If you dig online deep enough, it's been rumored that there's a single adventure from this edition that was completed. If you find it, it supposedly contains a summary of the rules for 3rd edition. I say things like rumored and supposedly, because I searched for several hours, and I couldn't find this adventure anywhere. However, several reputable sources claim that it exists, though I would note that they didn't say where they found it either. So while I'm reporting it as fact, i got to admit I'm a bit skeptical about it. If you feel like digging for it, go ahead. If you find it, shoot me a pic or drop me a note or whatever at roleplayinghistorypodcast at gmail.com and I will give you credit for your find on the air. And you know what? I'll figure out a way to dig up some sort of giveaway tchotchke thing for you for it. There's your challenge. Next up for Paranoia was a new publishing home. Once Kostikian and Goldberg got the rights back, they licensed them out to Mongoose Publishing, who has, by the way, held that license ever since. Kostikian joined with Alan Varney, Aaron Alston, Paul Baldowski, Beth Fishy, and Dan Curtis Johnson to develop Paranoia XP, which was released in 2004. However, Microsoft got their undies in a bind and requested that XP be removed from the title, and Mongoose did so. Alan Varney, who has been credited as the primary designer of this edition, has stated on a number of occasions that his primary aim with the new edition of Paranoia was to get the game back to its roots, while still taking advantage of nearly 20 years of game design progress. A big step Varney took was to declare everything published after the second edition supplements The People's Glorious Revolutionary Adventure to be unproducts. In other words, that material was no longer part of continuity and wasn't recommended for use with this new edition. As The People's Glorious Revolutionary Adventure was dropped in early 1989, this meant that 16 years of material was literally tossed aside by Varney and the other designers of Paranoia XP. Insofar as the style of Paranoia XP, we'll get into bigger detail on that one in just a couple of minutes. Another big change for XP was the return to the fold of the longtime Paranoia artist Jim Holloway, who provided new art to help put the new version of Paranoia out front. By the time they began working on XP, Varney, Goldberg, and Kostikian were well aware of the burgeoning online community for games and gamers, and in creating this version of Paranoia, they collaborated with the Paranoia online fan community. Varney further utilized the online community. He ran an online game called The Toothpaste Disaster. 
From that, some of the best players and writers were brought together to write official paranoia material. Their first credited work was the mission supplement, Crash Priority. In 2006, the mantle of primary writer for the paranoia line passed from Varney to Gareth Hanneran, who continued to shepherd materials through. In 2007, Paranoia was given the honor of being chosen for the Origins Awards Hall of Fame. Two years later, Mongoose Publishing announced they'd be retiring the XP line as they had plans to release a 25th anniversary edition. The 25th anniversary edition was released later in 2009, and it was not only a new edition of the rulebook, but it also had two new rulebooks. One that cast the players as higher clearance internal security investigators, and another with them as ultraviolet high programmers. I'll explain that in a few more minutes. Now, for those who'd invested fully in the XP line, Mongoose reassured them, stating that the XP stuff would have a 90% compatibility rate with the new books. The XP rules were slimmed down and streamlined for the 25th anniversary, and each of the three books in the set are self-contained games. Again, we'll get into game styles and modes in a bit. As of today, there's been one more edition of Paranoia. In 2014, Mongoose Publishing announced a Kickstarter to fund the creation and initial publication of a new version. Called Red Clearance, it's a completely different version of Paranoia than any of the previous versions. But for that to make sense, you'll have to understand how the previous versions of the game have played, and so I'll hold off on this for another minute or so. Alright, so we've looked at the history of Paranoia. What about all those reviews I've been babbling on about for the past, oh, 10, 11 minutes or so? I've checked out more than a dozen different reviews, and each of them spoke very highly of the game, other than, of course, 5th edition. They talked about the game style, they talked about the game play, they talked about the quality of the product. I think you get the point. So, let's just say that those reviews were fantastic, and if you're interested, you can check them out online. What we do know is that Paranoia has consistently gotten great reviews, it's consistently sold well, so long as time and attention to detail has been injected into the game. Okay, so that's done. Let's get to the part I've been promising for now, what, 13 minutes? Let's get into the game itself. As I mentioned earlier, Paranoia is set in a dystopian future. The city the game is set in is controlled by the computer, which is also known as Friend Computer. Also, information is controlled by color-coded security clearance. I'll expand on that in a minute. By the way, information controlled also includes the actual rules of the game. Y yeah, you can see where we're going here. The player characters start off as enforcers of the computer's authority, known officially as troubleshooters, because as the name implies, they shoot trouble. They're given missions to seek out and eliminate threats to the computer's control. Oh, and the PCs are also part of prohibited underground movements, which means they will be among the threats to the computer's control. In fact, in their underground movement roles, each character will probably have a secret objective or two, which can include theft from and murder of the other player characters in their group. Now, I've mentioned this in previous episodes, but I need to say it here again. While the computer is in charge, and it does give out orders, those orders are, on a good day, hard to understand. They can be poorly worded, poorly phrased, or just not make a bit of sense. On a bad day, the orders are contradictory. Force characters to use dangerous, faulty, or experimental equipment. And by the way, you never trust experimental equipment in Paranoia. Frequently, the orders, if followed, have the death of the character as a distinct possibility. Oh, and failure to either follow the orders or succeed? Death. Combine that with the distinct probability that one of your fellow player characters has the orders to off you, and the game gets very interesting. Oh, oh yeah, and I almost forgot to mention the clones. Each player character gets six clones, which replace the previous upon its death. So this allows for some games to get pretty daggum gruesome. 
Oh, and more clones can be purchased if you have sufficient favor with the computer. Look, I can say that from personal experience, the comedy of watching the player characters work against each other can be as much fun as them actually trying to work together to accomplish the overall mission. All right, in my research, I found something that explains the game perfectly. Unfortunately, I didn't write down what site I got it from, so if it's your site, let me know, and you'll get credit next week. The computer is your friend. Happiness is mandatory, citizen. Stay alert. Keep your laser handy. Your fellow troubleshooters are probably all commie mutant traitors, so be ready to turn them in or terminate them to be rewarded by your friend, the computer. So, comrade, let the chaos begin. Now, I've been saying the entire show that I was going to discuss the changes in style throughout the various versions of the game. And since I'm a man of my word, we're going to do that right now. First edition, as I mentioned earlier, focused heavily early on in the dark dystopian future, with the humor meant as a way to bring a little light into that darkness. As time moved on, supplements began to open the game up a bit more, with the slapstick humor and more focus on satire coming to the forefront. Second edition, however, really made some adjustments. The darkness of dystopia was pretty much done away with, and the game focused on the humor, which, to be honest, is what most of us were already focusing on. Second edition also added the ability to travel through space and time, play in a computerless alpha complex, or in an alpha complex where the computer was battling other factions for control. As I mentioned earlier, there were four basic eras this edition could be broken into. In the classic era, there was no meta plot and nothing big got changed. Secret society wars brought in the concept of running themes and conspiracies that ran from supplement to supplement. The crash is where the computerless alpha complex came into being. Some played this as a result of the secret society wars, while others just played it as a standalone. Reboot. This is where the computer was battling other factions for control. There were a good number of supplements that played this format. I know I said a little earlier I was going to get deep into security clearances, but I'm going to be honest, the only thing you really need to know is they're color-coded. The lowest being infrared, the highest being ultraviolet. Most PCs are red, which is one step above infrared. So when you're talking about a supplement that allows players to play at an ultraviolet level of security clearance, that means they've got the highest clearance in the game. And yeah, that makes for interesting gameplay. All right, let's move on to 5th edition and its changes. Nah, it's an unproduct, so friend computer has dictated we shall not discuss it. Paranoia XP had three game modes you could play. Zap is anarchic slapstick, and it doesn't even try to make sense. It's been long suggested that if you're running a Paranoia one-shot, this is probably the way to do it. Classic is just like 2nd edition really is supposed to be, thus the term classic. Straight is a fairly new style. This goes back to the darker style, like 1st edition, but it brings in the comical components that make Paranoia the game we all know and love. 25th Anniversary keeps the three styles from XP, but Straight is considered the default, and the other two styles get small mentions in the appendix. The Red Clearance Edition is the most radical. First off, it utilizes a D6 system, which none of the other systems had. Also, players had cards for equipment, mutant powers, secret societies, and combat actions. So this is the one that really went, like, 180 from everything else. Insofar as the game's styles, it was set for a straight style, with nothing really being mentioned about the other game styles. Again, for me, I learned how to play on first edition, so it's the one nearest and dearest to my heart. However, it's nearly impossible to find these days. Paranoia XP is a bit easier to find, but it's also out of print, so good luck. This would be one of those rare occasions I would advocate for utilizing sites like DriveThruRPG.com and get your PDFs of the version you want to play, and then get to playing. And remember... The computer is your friend. And with that, we come to the end of today's tour. Yeah, I know this week's episode's a little bit shorter than the last couple, but I decided with Paranoia, I just wanted to talk about Paranoia. <laughs>
There was no adding another subject in, not adding in another topic. I just wanted to give paranoia the love it deserves. Next week, we're going to look at first edition AD&D and the boxed sets of D&D. I'm pretty sure that's going to be a longer episode, so be ready. Also, remember that you've still got time to get your votes in for the November 26th episode. I've also decided that rather than have the votes tabulated in time to announce next week, I'm extending the deadline to November 24th. Really, all that means is I'm not going to be telling you what we're covering the following week at the end of next week's episode. It's going to be a surprise! You can still vote on Spotify or by sending me messages on Facebook, Twitter, or by email or on YouTube. By the way, you can reach us at Facebook, Role Playing History Podcast, Twitter at Role Playing P, YouTube, Role Playing History Podcast. You know what to do when you get there. Shoot the emails to Role Playing History Podcast at gmail.com. As always, the music we use to come in and out of this show comes from pixabay.com. Check it out if you're looking for royalty free music to use for your project. Next week, more D&D and AD&D. Yay! But that's next week. Until then, I'm Wayne Davis and your role-playing history. <laughs>